<laughs> At least we're all on speaking terms. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to see everybody, and I want to say happy Mother's Day to the mothers that are listening. <laughs> Welcome this morning, and um, I'm so glad to see you all. It's a beautiful Mother's Day, isn't it? What a beautiful day. So uh, if you have your mother still with you, give her an extra hug today. All right, I can't go there. <laughs> so moving on. We have a sweet note from Jean and Olean Rollins, uh, and I'm sure this is in regard to... Food. our class um, provided a meal for them because they don't get to come and to church and their hearts are here. They so long to be in church, but just physical issues prevent that. Let me just read this note to you. Um, dear class, thank you so much for the good meal at Linda and Jean's. We always enjoy eating with them, and you made it special. Also, the delicious pound cake. We can enjoy it a little while longer. Uh, Betty Sue, did you make a pound cake? Or, uh, bless you, and thank you, Linda, for the meal. For This is from Jean and Olean. Uh, we appreciate your concern and thoughtfulness also for your calls and cards. Jean and I really miss uh, the Sunday School class and fellowship with all of you. Please continue to pray for us. We're so proud to be a part of a wonderful church and with such loving and caring people. So thank you for those of you who send cards, and I would encourage you to send them a card from time to time. I, sometimes I feel like these people who are, to use that term, homebound, that they tend to feel n neglected or like we have forgotten them, and which we have not. So um, please, time from time to time, just send not only the Rollinses, but all of these people in our class who are not able to be with us on a regular basis. Um, oh, I'm asked to remind you about the Dollar a Week Partners, um, and this is the Minnesota Ministry. It's a mission field, actually. And you know, in, I'm just reading more and more <clears throat> about especially Minneapolis, how it has become a center for recruitment, ISIS recruitment. Uh, that's, I don't know why that is a hotbed of that there, but it is. And so these, the Stocklands who are there and those who are, of course, I think the Stocklands have retired, but those who are going to be uh, taking their place and those who are ministering there, we really need to pray for them. That's a, uh, that indeed is a mission field. So. Please keep them in prayer. And he, Bob Stockland has asked us to remember the Northern City Baptist Church. He says it's one of the oldest congregations in the Baptist Association. They have experienced difficulty through the years, and now they have voted to disband. Please pray for them. So that is a um, sad development there. Muslim mayor, yes, London has elected a Muslim mayor. Um, and I, I was telling Daryl coming on that our president has plans to um, make a national monument of a gay bar in, I believe it's in New York City, where he says the LGBT movement began. So therefore it should be a protected site, a national monument. It will be protected like our monuments in Washington, like our national parks, a gay bar. Mm. Uh, Franklin Graham, and sometimes I think Franklin Graham is the lone voice in the wilderness. Amen. He has so decried that and just blasted that uh, proposal and calling out our president on that, and rightly so. Uh, we need to pray for Franklin Graham because he, it just seems like he's like there on the cutting edge. And I, I, I told Daryl, I said, you know, where's the leaders of all these other denominations that should be standing with him and speaking out against this and decrying that? So um, anyway, it, our, our nation is in a sad state, but... You know, I believe there is a stirring in the body of Christ. I just sense that, 
And it's evidenced in, there are some things that give evidence to that, that I believe the body of Christ is stirring and um, we need to really be on our faces before God for our nation. This is such a critical time. And especially with uh, an election looming before us. And, you know, we look at that and we think, oh, I just want to just throw up my hands or I just want to pull the cover over my head and just say, world, go away. But we can't do that. Jesus called us to be the light to the world. We are the salt. So um, we just need to pray that even... Um, regardless of who gets into office in this next election, we need to be praying for them and praying God just somehow turn this nation. And even if we have somebody ungodly in there, which I know we pray, uh, and I pray God raise up godly leadership in our nation. But even when there are the ungodly in office, we, we need to pray, God, turn their hearts. God, even use them to accomplish your will. Because, you know, God used heathens. He used King Cyrus. Cyrus was not a, he was not uh, an Israelite. He was not Jewish. But yet God used him. God said of Nebuchadnezzar, he used Nebuchadnezzar, of course, as he, he called him my battle axe. He used Nebuchadnezzar, of course, to bring judgment against Israel. But I'm saying those that are heathen, God can, when we pray and trust God and just ask Him, God, we just want Your will to be done. God, we want, we want God to be God of this nation once again. God will hear our cry. He said to Ezekiel, I sought for a man. He didn't say, I sought for 20 men, I sought for 50. He said, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap that I should not bring judgment to the land. Sadly, in Israel's case, God completed that statement by saying, I sought for a man, but I found none. I hope in America that when God is seeking for those who will intercede, He's going to find many. Mark. Uh, well, you know as well, Montgomery was with us and, and uh, Brother Graham. And, you know, he said that we've got to not only get involved ourselves, but find those godly men. Yes. And get them in office. But I'm telling you, we've got such a lawlessness in this nation. Yes. I, I guess, did you also hear about the, the proclamation for Mother's Day? That yes. That came down to the person in the White House. Mm-hmm. And Despicable. I mean, it's, it's absolutely... Explain it. It's insulting. It is. It's it insulting is. to me and to Americans to have him say those words. Yes. About because he wants to gender, gender uh, trans, trans people and the LGBT. First of all, you've got to, don't let the world keep using those terms, okay? Exactly. There is no LGBT. Right. There's no such thing. And when people use it, you need to remind them. And across this nation, we've got to start standing up. This lawlessness is just getting out of control. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Basically what uh, this, the proclamation from the White House was for Mother's Day yesterday, uh, just to paraphrase, to all mothers, regardless of your gender. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, all right, Debbie. Yes. And so I heard Jonathan Kahn, the author of The Harbinger, his prayer, absolutely. It was five minutes, but that prayer was unbelievable. And if you haven't heard it, look it up on the internet. Jonathan Kahn, G-A-H-N, and the prayer, that will, that will make you fall to your knees. If you don't fall to your mm -hmm. knees, I can't imagine. I actually covered that last Sunday, and I read part of Paul Ryan's address as well as his prayer. But... I, and I told the class, I, I didn't hear about this on the, no, on the media. The only reason I knew about it is because Myra sent me the forward from Paul Ryan's office about that. I just put it on the TV and saw it. And, um, yes, she said it was aired on Daystar, but I, I, I didn't know about it until after it was over. And I kept looking back to Daystar, hoping they would re-air that. I don't know why they have not played that again. Well, that needs to be played again and again and again. 
And I was so pleased and thrilled to see. She said, Myra said there were at least 40 congressmen who were there and uh, many who spoke and who prayed. And I appreciated so much uh, Speaker Ryan, uh, Paul Ryan, praying in Jesus' name. Yes. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Yes. I noticed that. Oh, I just made you. I know. So there are some good things going on. There are, but the media is not going to tell us about them. No, the secular media. Secular media is not, media is not going to tell us about those. All right. Um, uh, just in the way of announcements, um, the right to life announcement, and um, since we've had problems about using the screen, Mark, I just didn't even depend on that. I just put it on the syllabus for today. So you'll see the details there to the, for that. And also our Agape Circle uh, Bible study ladies that we've been meeting at Kemp Meadows. Guess what? Ta-da! We're moving. We've outgrown the facility. Uh, isn't that wonderful? Yes. We are moving, and the first, Winfield First Baptist has been so gracious to welcome us there. So we'll be moving our Bible study over to the Winfield First Baptist. And so if you come, all you have to do is drive around to the back parking lot, park in the back, and we'll have ladies out there in the parking lot who will take you or show you where to go in the, uh, in the, in the complex there. If you're like me, you're not, I've been in the music building part and in the main sanctuary, but I've not actually, I'm not familiar with that whole layout. So anyway, just drive around to the back and park there and somebody will be there to show you. So I'm really excited about that. I, I think that's going to be a blessing to us because like I said, we've outgrown. The, that's a wonderful problem to have. That's a great problem. All right. I hope you have your syllabus from last Sunday because I want to complete that and then go on into today's syllabus. I don't know just how far I'll get. It's, it's like with any other series that I've done. I think, oh, I can cover this in two to three weeks, and it just grows. So um, anyway, I hope you have your syllabus from last Sunday, and we will finish that. All right, let's open with prayer. Do we have special needs um, in our class. We're glad to see Ms. Shelby back again today. Um, any special needs today? I, I know we still have... Oh, 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 yes, see, I didn't have one of those right here in front of me. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll borrow this and I'll give it back to you. Oh, uh, Debbie is here, so uh, uh, the snacks for the uh, Alabama Baptist Children's Home Camp uh, they've asked us, uh, they're asking churches to provide snacks. So, Debbie, say something about this, if you would. Uh, this is what Mr. and Mrs. Butler always did. Good morning. Start doing it, and basically, we, I have contacted Brother Keith uh, at the uh, missions, and Laura uh, Kimbrew is going to send out emails, setting it up. Uh, there's only six churches that have emails, both smaller churches. Syllabus. No, I've got one. <laughs> so she's sending letters to those people, and they're going to bring their material, their supplies, their snacks, and everything to the um, which Brother Keith there at the mission in the Bur in Hamilton. We will pick them up and bring them. And you, if you all have anything to donate, please bring it to the church, and Doug will place it wherever Doug will place it. And we will pick them up and take them down June the first. Okay. So uh, we went last year. There are. Oh, there are thousands that attend that camp. It is amazing, and uh, it is uh, very worthwhile. And there are those who go and learn how to be ambassadors to go out and support uh, the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. So if you could bring anything, it is it's greatly appreciated. And that uh, list that Barbara gave you is, is a great list to look at. I don't know how you got it. Did you send it to me? Yes. Um, and we have some more of those if somebody didn't. I asked her just to give one per couple. But if you did not get one, if you're a single, of course, take one. Uh, if you need a list, if you want to hold your hand up, we'll get those out. Okay. And they are over here on the table after we conclude if you <clears throat> would like to pick one of those up. And uh, let me just say another. Qu I know we have a lot going on today. Another quick word. Um, and there may be some that I don't know about, but we have two in our class that actually need a, a 
applause and congratulations. One of those is Ashley Gray. Ashley graduated yesterday with her master's and we're just so proud of Ashley. And Emily Hines graduated with her master's in counseling. <laughs> And I don't think Emily's here this morning, but anyway, we need to take note of that. And when you see her, you might congratulate her. Now, have I missed anybody else in the class? Now, let's don't start with our children, okay? I, I know we have a lot of children and grandchildren who are probably graduating, but if you have graduated, if you've got a degree or whatever, speak now. <laughs> All right, I just knew about those two. So, um, anyway, we're... we're proud of those two members of our class. All right, let's open with prayer, and um, let's remember all of those in our class who have health issues. Father, I'm sorry. Oh, now, oh. Yes, and what about Linda LaDuke? How is she? Does anybody know? Yes. Okay, so moving her to Birmingham. <clears throat> we need to remember Linda and Marguerite as well. And so, Red, you're having surgery tomorrow? All right. I didn't see a hand. <laughs> All right, let's remember him in prayer and uh, that everything will go well with that. Okay, now Annette can take care of you cook for you and do all those things you did for her. <laughs> it's turnabout's fair, isn't it? <laughs> okay, let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for this beautiful day. Father, you've just been so gracious and so full of mercy to us, and we praise you and thank you. You're worthy of all praise. And Father, I just lift up before you all of these who have needs this morning, names that have been called in the unspoken requests and others, Lord, in our, that are connected with our class that we don't even know about. And we just pray, Father, that every need will be met. We thank you, Jesus, for your uh, sacrifice upon the cross, that there you purchased our salvation, but you also purchased our healing. You purchased our peace, our joy. Everything we have need of there, it has been... Uh, there you provided for that, and we thank you for that redeeming sacrifice. So, Lord, today we lay hold upon that provision, and we appropriate that in behalf of these who have needs this morning. We pray the spirit of comfort, Lord, for those who are in need of comfort. And uh, we just ask that the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus and his peace and his love and comfort to each of these. Now, Lord, we thank you again for the privilege that we have to gather in the name of Jesus and to look into your wonderful word. We, we desire, Lord, to just grow in the word and grow in our relationship with you and to know truly who we are in Christ. And so I ask all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we're glad to have Matt and Casey with us today, too, and looking forward to their ministry in uh, music to us. All right, we are uh, we're looking at uh, repentance and salvation last Sunday. Born again, what does it mean? So what does the phrase, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does that mean? It means literally born from above, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, I, I'm fully convinced, and I know, as I said last Sunday, I know you all think this is Christianity 101. <laughs> But we need that sometimes because I think we, we forget or maybe some don't even know what is ours in Christ. We are in Christ. What does that mean? How do we become in Christ? How are we born into Christ? That's what I want us to look at. And so many times I think we, we don't comprehend what is ours, what the blessings are to us simply by being in Christ. So I just want, I feel like I needed to start with repentance. You know, Charles Stanley says repentance is the missing link. And I believe that it is. There are, there are too many people that have walked down to the front. I'm, I'm talking across the board now. 
uh, have just walked to the front, as they say, shaken the preacher's hand or signed a card, and they think that's all there is to uh, repentance or to being born again. No, repentance and being born again are works of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And it, uh, being born again means being regenerated. Our spirit is made alive and we receive the spirit of Christ. We have so many blessings that are ours. And uh, I think sometimes we just, we fail to understand all of those blessings that are ours because we don't really comprehend who we are in Christ, who we are in Christ. So... How does one experience being born again? This is really basic. How does one experience being born again? What is the scripture? Romans 10, 9. Let's all quote it together. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, don't be shy, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Very good. <laughs> All right, once more with gusto this time. <laughs> oh, as Dr. Kelly said to the choir one night when she was directing, okay, now on the signal to everybody, just bust forth. <laughs> I want you to bust forth with Romans 10, 9. Oh, and now you can cheat. <laughs> Let's all read it together. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And this thing of confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, it's not just saying the right equation. It's not just saying that. It is truly, a, it is from saying it from a deep conviction that Christ indeed is sovereign Lord. And then believe in thine heart that, Christ has, uh, that God has raised him from the dead. Resurrection is absolutely essential to our salvation because resurrection, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our preaching is what? It's in vain. It's in vain, yes, because the resurrection... Uh, gave validity to Christ and that he was who he said he was, indeed, the Son of God, the Messiah. And it also was a sign that God accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our sins. God accepted his sacrifice. So it's so important to have an understanding of resurrection. So we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit when we're born again. We are baptized into the body of Christ. I want you to look with me at 1 Corinthians 12. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I actually have three scriptures here that I, I want to point out to you. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And it's on the screen if you don't have your, uh, if you don't have that, right before you. Thank you all for bringing your Bibles. I'm like, I believe as Charles Stanley said, I love to hear pages turning. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and you can look on the screen if you need to. For by one Spirit, what Spirit is that? It's capitalized. That's the Holy Spirit. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now when that says we're baptized into one body, that is not talking about water baptism. It's being baptized into Christ. We're baptized into the body of Christ. It is, it, it is a... Uh, it's a spiritual immersion. And of course, when we go through water baptism, that is a symbol, uh, it, that is symbolic of this spiritual immersion that we have already experienced. And then uh, Galatians 3.27, and maybe Steve can just give us that one on the screen. Galatians 3.27 for as many, and it's on the screen, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then one more, Romans 6, 3, 4. Romans 6, 3, 4. And while you're turning Romans 6, 3, 4, um, Emily, we actually gave you an applause before you came in. <laughs> Congratulations on your uh, completing your degree, your master's. I was sharing with the class about that, so we're proud of you. Romans 6, 3, 4. 
Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In newness of life. Oh, I love that phrase. Walk in newness of life. On your syllabus today, I think I titled that, Have You Been Changed? Have you been changed or is it the same old, same old? If it's, if it's the same old, same old, you haven't truly met Christ. I'm telling you, I believe when we encounter Christ and we have that uh, a life, we have a life-changing transformation when we make Jesus, truly make Jesus the Lord of our lives, when we are born again, that is a life-changing event. Walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New, yes. Uh, King James says new creature, but actually it's a new creation. One translation says a new species. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new species, species. I looked up that word new in the Greek uh, New Testament to see just exactly, because we, hear, we read so much in Paul's epistles about walk in newness of life, put on the new man. We are a new creation. And you know, the Greek dictionary, that what that word uh, conveys is nothing, this is what the dictionary says, nothing similar to a past experience. It's not just a makeover. Oh, and ladies know what makeovers are. Don't we love makeovers? Yeah, have you seen those pictures? I wish I'd had a, I should have brought a sample. Uh, you've seen women, they used to have a show on TV where they'd bring these women in, and of course I'm sure they made them look just as bad as they could when they brought them out. <laughs> Probably like all of us before we put anything on our faces in the morning. Uh, they bring them out and then they say, we're going to do a makeover. And that, you know, the makeup experts and the hair experts and the fashion experts, you know, they put them through the makeover and, well, they come out looking like a starlet, you know. That's a makeover. Underneath all of that change is still the same old person. But when we are in Christ, when we encounter Christ and truly our spirit is born again and our spirit is regenerated by the spirit of Christ, we become a new, totally new creation. Nothing similar to what we were in before, as the Greek dictionary says. Qualitatively new. In other words, not a makeover. Not turning over a new leaf. I am a new person in Christ Jesus. I walk in newness of life. I put on the New man, and Paul says in Ephesians 4, cast off, take off that old man, the old man, put on the new man. Oh, aren't you glad that you're just brand new? Just brand new. That's what Christ does for us. Yes, Mark? You know, that we just read Romans, you know, uh, 6, 3, and 4. Yes. Uh -huh. It's the same as Jesus being laid back in the grave. Right, yes. Says, then you're raised from that baptism. You come back up to, to be this new, to walk in newness of life, or to walk more Christ-like. Yes. More Christ-like. Yes. And, I mean, it, it's so clear people miss that. So, because you're actually dead and buried. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be dead to the old. Right. And I, you're raised, right? You're raised up out of that water to, to walk in newness of life. Yes, and here would be a good point to turn to Romans 6 and read that entire chapter because that's what Paul talks about there, uh, being crucified. And you know, he said, Paul said in one of his epistles, I die daily. Uh, I, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So what does that mean? Uh, taking up your cross, that doesn't mean that cratchety woman you're married to. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, rebellious kids. It doesn't mean that sorry boss you work for. That's not your cross. I've heard people say that. That's just my cross I have to bear. <laughs> no. <laughs> when Jesus said, take up your cross, when one took up their cross, where were they going? To the death, to the death. Jesus is saying, die to yourself. 
die to self. You're alive unto God. Oh, I'm telling you, it's, have you been changed? Have you been changed? I so wanted to talk today about the fruit of the Spirit because it's when we're born again, then we start bringing forth fruit unto God. But how is it that, you know, that fruit of the Spirit? What about that fruit of the Spirit? But we're going to have to leave that for another Sunday. Oh, before we move on about the blessings of being born again, that's where I got to last week, but I sure want to get down a little more to spirit, soul, and body. Take your outline from last Sunday if you have that, and let's just review uh, the first half. We got about halfway through. <clears throat> so Roman numeral one, this is from last Sunday, May 1st. Uh, blank and blank are two separate works. What? Repentance. Repentance and salvation are two separate works, but both are produced by the Holy Spirit working in the heart. John 3, 1 through 7. Being born again literally means being born from above. How does one experience new birth? First, confess Jesus as sovereign Lord. And number two, believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. To whom is the invitation extended to be born again? Is it just to a select few? No, absolutely not. Oh, Whosoever will, if any man, he's not, uh, First Peter, Peter said, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the call. And I gave you all those scriptures and we read all of those last Sunday. All right, let's talk about the blessings of being born again. And this is just, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some that I just, that just came to, the, came to me quickly. And I, so this is just kind of a, a uh, just a consensus here, a, just a short synopsis of our, we have so many blessings, so many blessings of being born again. Number one, our sins are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. I think we so glibly say that. We, we so glibly say that. Our sins have been forgiven. Um. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption. What does the word redemption or redeem mean? Buy back. means to buy back. In whom we have redemption, what? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Through grace. And then secondly, we are justified. That is, we are declared righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Um, God was reconciling us unto himself through Christ. Justified. And in the, in the children's definition of justified is just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. In justification, we are saved from the penalty of sin. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, the door to the throne room has been thrown open. Come on in. We have peace with God. And then thirdly, we are sanctified. What does the word sanctified mean? It means set apart, prepared and set apart for God's use. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, I want us to, um, if you have your Bibles, turn there. I know Steve will be, um, uh, yes, at, at verse, starting at verse 9. <laughs> Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Now, keep in mind the, uh, the context here. It's the church at Corinth. Corinth was a, it was like the San Francisco of the first century. Uh, in the Roman Empire, um, homosexuality was glorified. It was a very common thing. And... This was a, the city of Corinth was like the, the capital center 
for pagan worship, ungodliness. Oh, uh, it, was a, it was a wicked, wicked city. Man, what a, what a mission field. <laughs> and Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Of course, they had, uh, y- y- we know they had, that was a church that had a lot of problems. They had a lot of problems. But I always point this out. Um, in his opening to the church at Corinth, he didn't say, okay, all of you, uh, yeah, all of you uh, worldly people, No, he said, to the saints at Corinth. I just love that. To the saints at Corinth. He is not putting a stamp of approval upon uh, the fact that some of the believers in the church, that uh, they had some things going on in the church that should not be. And so uh, he, he is so patiently writing to the church at Corinth and to teach them, to bring them to maturity And look what he says to them in chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And speaking of homosexuality there. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. I'm telling you, he's given an exhaustive list here, isn't he? Nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Ah, such were some of you, he says to the church. But look, I, I love this. But, but. Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you, but you have been washed. You've been cleansed by the Spirit of God. He says you were sanctified. Sanctified, that means cleaned up, prepared to be used by God in His kingdom. Sanctified. Saved from the power of sin. In other words, sin no longer has dominion over you. Sin is no longer your master. That's not to say we won't, uh, we'll sin, we'll all stumble, we'll make mistakes. But, but sin does not have power over us as it did before we were born again. And then fourthly, we have, we'll have eternal life when we get to heaven. Now, when do we have eternal life? When do we have eternal life? Right now, right now. If you've been born again right now, you've got eternal life. Yes. Uh, Ephesians 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Paul, uh, John wrote, 1 John chapter 5, and this is the record that God has given. In other words, God has already given us eternal life. We've, we, we're already partakers of eternal life. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. And then fifthly, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. We are... Okay, number five, we are blank with the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. And Steve's got it for us. If you want to just look up there. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed. You ought to put a circle around that. I've, I've got a circle around it and I've got it highlighted. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Oh, those two verses are packed so full. Those right there deserve an hour just themselves. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul uses that same, um, that same phrase in 2 Corinthians 1.22. And then there's another reference in 2 Corinthians where he, he again brings that over. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And verse 14, I, and those of you that have been in my class for some time, you've heard me deal with this, but I just love this. The Holy Spirit is the, this being sealed with the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. The earnest, what is earnest money? 
It's a down payment, that's right. It means I'm going to give you a down payment on this car, but I, and I'm coming back to pay the rest of it. I'm going to get this car. Do you know what? The, in, the, in the Greek, I hope some of you remember this. In the Greek, the word earnest is the same word as uh, what word in English? Engagement ring, that's right. The Holy Spirit, yes, is the pledge or the, in, it's literally the engagement ring. Isn't that exciting? Jesus gave you an engagement ring when you got born again. What is that engagement ring? It's not a diamond. It's something much more precious than a diamond. What is it? It's the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit. Now, I know when we are born again initially and we, receive, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, but I believe we have to keep being refilled. We have to keep being refilled. There are other fillings. Jesus has given us that engagement ring. And what does that mean? The Holy Spirit, he's, he's saying, I'm just giving you a measure of, of the Holy Spirit right now, but that's a sign that I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. When, G, when Gerald, Gerald, I say, what's that man's name? Daryl. <laughs> Why did I say Gerald? Where'd that come from? Whoops. <laughs> Let's see. Now, what's his name? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Maybe I was going to try to say Jesus. That's what it was when I was thinking of Daryl. <laughs> Is my face red? It's hot. <laughs> oh. When Daryl gave me an engagement ring, you know what? I, you know the message that sent to me? <laughs> yeah. Same thing, gals, when, when that husband gave you that engagement ring, if he gave you an engagement ring. Yeah, that's meaning I'm serious. I'm going to, one of these days, when we set the date, uh, this puts you on hold, but I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to bring you home with me and give you my name. That's, that's just what Jesus is saying to us. I want you to know there's going to be a date. We're going to set a date. The Father has set the date. I don't know when it is, but the Father has set the date. And at the date, I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to take you home, and we're going to be one. He has given us the Holy Spirit of promise. Oh, how glorious. And until this is just, he says, Paul says, the being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, that's just the down payment. Until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. I thought we were already redeemed. He's not talking about our spirit. Our spirit has already been redeemed. Our spirit, man, has been made perfect because we've been re it has been regenerated by the Spirit of Christ. He's talking about our bodies. See, our, uh, Jesus on the cross, he purchased our body as well as our soul and spirit. But our body has not been redeemed. But when will our bodies be redeemed? At the rapture or the resurrection of the saints. That's right. So we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our, it's the down payment, it's the engagement ring of our inheritance. And inheritance means what? <coughs> it means inheritance, doesn't it? Yes, it just means inheritance. Absolutely. It means there's more to come. There's more to come. And then sixthly, the blessing of being born again. We are What? Let's see how I... We are made. I should have put, uh, put the blank there under made. We are made what? Righteous. And it is not... We, it's not we are declared righteous. That's what justification is. We are made. We are literally made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him to be sin who knew no sin. Who is that talking about? Jesus. Jesus had no sin. But God made him to be sin. In other words, the sins of humanity were laid on Jesus. He was 
He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. As I said last Sunday, there was a divine, there's a divine swap at, at Calvary. Jesus took on our sins. He gives us of his righteousness and his holiness. And I, I believe it's Peter that says, after God, our spirit is in righteousness, is, re, is created in righteousness and holiness. And those of you who have been around me very long, you know that I just have a problem with that statement. Uh, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. <laughs> I am not an old sinner. I once was an old sinner, but I have been saved by grace. Now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am a partaker of the divine nature, Peter says. We are sons and daughters. We've been seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, let's don't sell our position short. Jesus paid too great a price. He paid too great a price for us to sell it short. Well, let's move on. Um, okay, on your outline, and I think you've probably got all those filled in on Roman numeral 4 from last Sunday's syllabus, our sins are forgiven, we are justified, we are sanctified, we're saved, that means saved from the power of sin. Number four, we now have eternal life. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And number six, we are made righteous. Now, this three-part being thing, I, I want to... Uh, our, uh, let's go ahead and fill that in. The, we are a three-part being, a spirit, the part that interacts with God. You know, Jesus said to the woman at the well, they that worship, the Father seeks such to worship Him. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is in our spirits that we interact with God. It's not in our flesh. It's not even in our soul. It's in our spirit. And we can't communicate and interact with God until that spirit is recreated and regenerated. And then B, body is the outer casing for the real you. You know, we put so much emphasis, don't we, and so much time, and I'm a fine one to talk, on this outer casing. We really spend a lot of time on this outer casing. And you know what's going to happen to this outer casing? It's going to decay. That's right, it's going to decay. The real you, the real me, is what part of us? Our spirit, our spirit. That's the part that's going to live forever. Our soul, soul is the third part of us. Mind, will, emotions, in other words, your personality. It's your mind, your will, your emotions. Uh, that's where your five senses reside. Now, I base this three-part being, of course, on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where Paul said, I pray your, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Uh, let me just look 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 to be sure I got, got all that right. Yeah, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we are a three-part being. Now, if you look on the syllabus for today, I just gave you that little diagram there of our three parts, our spirit, and then our soul, and then um, that outer casing, which is the body. Let me just talk about those three right there, the spirit, soul, and body. Again, the spirit is that part of us that communicates with God. When Adam and Eve sinned, you know, God said to them, uh, God said, you know, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what'll happen? You'll surely die. He wasn't talking about the physical outer body. What part was he talking about? That spirit, that spirit. Because, you know, Adam and Eve walked with God in the evening. They communed with him. They had that, that fellowship with him. And sure enough, when they fell into sin, that spirit man died. So because we inherit that sin nature of Adam, when, you, when we are born physically, our spirit is literally dead. It's dead. But when we're born again, the spirit 
comes alive, it's regenerated, and the Spirit of Christ comes to live in that spirit part of us. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he made alive. The King James says, You hath he quickened. But you, you he has made alive, which were dead in trespasses and sins. Yes, there it is on the screen. You hath he quickened, which literally means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we receive the Spirit of Christ. And here is where that comes in that I was talking about the newness of life. We have a new life. We are a new man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. New, brand new, not made over. And then, of course, the body, uh, as I said, that's the outer casing. When we are saved, when we are born again, what happens to this body? Stays the same. <laughs> I would like to have dropped off 10 pounds. <laughs> Won't happen. As I heard some, uh, I, I don't know if it was Robert Morris, Andrew Womack, one of those said, uh, when you got saved, if you were fat, when you got up, you were still fat. <laughs> I guess that goes for skinny too, or short, or tall, or whatever. Uh, our, Jesus purchased our bodies through his death and resurrection, but our body is not, not saved as such. And this body is going to decay in the grave, but guess what? I'm going to get a new body, that's right. Yes, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die. But we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And he goes on to say, For this mortal will put on immortality, and this corruptible will put on incorruption, and then will be brought to pass that saying that Matthew and Casey are going to sing about, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Yes, death and the grave no longer uh, have a victory over us because Jesus conquered death. Can you say, thank you, Jesus? We no longer have to fear death. No. Oh, and there's an old song that says, I'll have a new body. I'll have a new life. That's right. I'm not the only one who knows that old song. But how true that is. And it's not, I'll have a new body, I'll have a new wife. <laughs> That's not what it says. <laughs> Barbara, I had a pastor years ago. I'd never heard a pastor since who was so anxious to die, just go home. He said, I, you know, and that, and I used to think that that was just so strange just to mm -hmm. die now. Don't you want to see your children grow and all that? And he said, I just want to be with Jesus today, right now, I want to be with him. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I think, honestly, I think the older we get in the Lord, the more that becomes a reality to us, yes. And the comment was made uh, when my mother passed away. Of course, most of mother's siblings had all, have already gone on to glory. And my grandparents, Mom and Papa Weeks, they're in glory. And someone made the comment to me, no wonder she wanted to go home. She's got as many on the other side or more than she's got here. And I thought, what a wonderful thought. You know, the older we get, we, those loved ones are going to the other side. And, you know, we long to be with Jesus, but we long to see our loved ones as well. And I, I honestly, I believe there are those who, who long to go on. I think about... Um, a precious, precious lady that we knew several years ago, um, Sandra Beasley's mother, as a matter of fact. Honestly, I, I'm telling you, that, that woman was a saint. <laughs> and uh, she had cancer. And oh, what a wonderful, victorious Christian. She, always, she had such joy in the Lord, such joy in the Lord. And... Uh, she was just uh, just continually regressing, and I know her daughter just oh was having such faith for her healing, and uh, she said, "I just know mother's going to be healed. I know she's going to be healed." But she went on to be with the Lord, 
But you know, honestly, what I believe it was, I believe that she just so longed to go on and be with Jesus. And when a person in their spirit is longing to go and be with Jesus. I'm telling you, we can't hold them here. We can't hold them here. So, yes, I, I, there's, there is a, there's just a blessing to think about that. Yes. Yes. I think it makes us righteous because he says we are, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we have been made righteous. Now that thing about imputed, that's a very interesting word as well because Paul says in that same package there, passage there that our sin, he no longer imputes sin to us. In other words, write that to our account. And I guess we could say... Um, Writing to our, into our account, Ronnie could talk to us more about that, putting that on your account. Uh, God no longer puts our sins on our accounts. It would be the same way with righteousness. It's been imputed to us, but we've also been, I, I believe we're made righteous simply because Paul makes that so plain in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 5 uh, 21. We have been made the righteousness of God. And he says in another place uh, that that we are made the righteousness and holiness of God. So, yes, it's not just a makeover, as I said. I, I believe that, I don't believe it's just, we're declared righteous, but I believe it's more than that. I believe we are literally made. And it's talking about our spirit. Talking about our spirit. Our spirit is made perfect in Christ Jesus. You know, our soul, uh, oh, and I so wanted to cover this today. Our soul, our spirit, Mind, will, and emotions, our minds, and our bodies are not saved. But what do we have to do? What did Paul say for us to do for those? Renew. Yes, he says, Romans 12 and 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Until you're born again, your soul has been in charge. You've been living by your five senses, what I want, what I think, what I like, uh, uh, as I heard Robert Morris say, and in fact, uh, it, Robert Morris was actually talking about spirit, soul, and body Thursday night. And he said that you're the soul man. You know, I'm a soul man. <laughs> we really shouldn't go around. So we should be singing, I'm a spirit man. <laughs> because the soul man is selfish. He's self-centered. He thinks about me. But Paul says we have to, we renew that. We, uh, un, until we're born again, the soul's been in charge. The soul's been pulling, you know, he's been calling the shots here. And then when we get born again, our spirit is made perfect in Christ Jesus. Your spirit's made perfect in Christ Jesus. And our spirit man says, okay, now the spirit's in charge. Spirit's in charge. And uh, again, to quote Robert Morris, the soul will say, not without a fight, pal. You see, our soul still wants to be in charge. All right, here's, a, here's an example. You're born again. You've been in the Word, con renewing your mind, learning what, uh, what it means to walk like Christ. Someone offends us. The spirit man says, hmm, remember, Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. But what does the soul man say? Get, I'm, yeah, I'm going to slug you. <laughs> That's what the soul says. But we have to say, oops, spirit's in charge now. Jesus says I'm to love those who despise, and I'm to pray for those who hate me. 